I'm trying to figure out how we should start this since I'm planning to walk into a minefield. <clears throat> okay, so one of the goals that I, that I have, so the Austin School isn't necessarily me, even though I do the majority of the Austin School talks, but so this is my goal within the Austin School, is specifically to unerase erased people. So I want to tell the stories of populations of people who have been sort of forgotten in the process of us being the conquerors telling our story, or erased and erased on purpose. So not just forgotten, but actually deliberately taken out. And towards that end, I have always kind of had the goal of, for example, telling the story of women um, I've written and published only one novel, but I've actually written more novels. And two of the novels, the, 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 the goal is to tell the story of erased women. The one that I have published, that's what, that's what that is. It's the Blood Throne of Caria, and it's about Artemisia I, who was a queen, an admiral, a governor, and she ruled in her own right, like she didn't have a king ruling with her. Um, I've been doing a lot of Arab history lately because one of the things that I discovered a long, long, long time ago when I was 19, uh, I had a realization moment, which was if you, I was already into history and politics when I was a teenager. If you walked up to me and you asked me to talk to you about ancient history, I could, I could give you a spiel on ancient Egypt or ancient Rome or the ancient Greeks. And then if you wanted to talk to me about uh, modern history, I was really into World War II and, and the, the American Civil War, and you know, I knew a little bit about the English Civil War. Like, I could, I could get into that. I could get into a lot of European history. <clears throat> I, you know, I knew there were stories about the Native Americans that I didn't know, but I was getting into that too. My, my undergraduate minor was Aztec and, and Maya archaeology because I was totally obsessed with uh, <clears throat> pre-Columbian Native American stories in Mexico. But I realized when I was 19, I knew nothing about a thousand year span of time. And that thousand year span of time was from the moment where I was incorrectly taught that the Roman Empire ended, right? Because we were taught that it ended in 476 AD and that's, that's beyond lie. That's, it's, it's so nonsensical. It ended in 1453, it's a thousand year a lie. And because we know the date and the moment and how the Roman Empire ended, the only way you could make the mistake is if you're a pathological liar and you're doing it on purpose, right? And, and so realizing these things, I went to the library and I, I found a book and it was on Arab history and it blew my mind that I didn't know any of it. And so at some level, I became obsessed with Arab history because it, it fills that thousand year span of time. Um, in a, and it makes the whole narrative of Western civilization and how Western civilization evolved make sense once you know that thousand year history. So, so for, for a long time, I've been really obsessed and aware of the effect of a deliberate erasure, deliberately trying to ignore other people's stories. So I've been focusing a lot on Arab history. I just did two, two talks on the Aztecs. Um, going forward, I'm gonna still be doing more Arab history because I have to do parts three and four of the Crusader talks. Um, but I, there's, there's other things I'll do there too. And then also I'm gonna do more Native American stuff. Um, for example, I'm definitely gonna do next semester or maybe spring a talk on the Apaches. I'll, I have plans to do a talk on the Lakota. Um, I might do a talk on the Iroquois Confederacy. Like there's, there are these Native American nations that just simply, we need to tell their stories. I mean, when you think about it, Americans, everybody should know the names of the nations that we massacred so you could have your nice little home, your nice little two by four stud home with sheetrock on the outside where the studs are spaced every 16 inches because at the end of the day, right, like the, the Tonkawa used to be here, but, but a lot of Native American nations didn't have specific chunks of territory. So in other words, there were other nations who, which also moved through here from time to time. 
<clears throat> but I, I kind of think it's genocide 101 to just at least, you've never heard of Tonkawa. That's how thoroughly we've deleted them. They were, they were uh, re <clears throat> reservationized concentration camp in Oklahoma, right? In an attempt to wipe them out. They have recently bought land near uh, Fredericksburg, Texas, because their holy site is, uh, I'm having a COVID brain moment. I can't remember the name of the big granite rock near Fr Enchanted Rock. Their holy site is Enchanted Rock. So the next time you're high and drunk and stumbling on it and vomiting and falling off the side, you're basically doing that in their Jerusalem. I just want you to know. <laughs> and so they bought a chunk of land so they can be close to their their holy site. And we need to know these stories. And we need to tell these stories. We need to unerase them. We need to make our complicity in this known. And the way we do that is by not erasing them, by unerasing them. So one of the things I've become really sensitive to is when I see erasure in, in movies. So there's a, I'm a, I love submarine movies. Just, I just out myself. If there, if there's a movie with a submarine in it, I am going to watch it, even if it's bad. I have seen some bad submarine movies. I just, I don't know why I like submarine movies. I also like space movies, which is really just a submarine movie. And I, and I made the connection when I was a kid because I was watching like a Star Trek episode where they're, they're fighting the Romulans, but the Romulans had a limited speed and they're trying to go silent in space. And I'm like, there's no noise in space running like and somebody drops a wrench and everybody's like oh no in a submarine yeah because sound goes through water but in space you can drop all the wrenches you want in your spaceship it's okay <laughs> and that as a kid i was like this is a submarine tv show and it's just the water is black and it's got sparkly little stars in it <laughs> so there is a movie u571 i watched it reluctantly years after it came out. And the reason I didn't want to watch it wasn't, it's World War II, it's a submarine movie. I, I'm obsessed with World War II. Like this is, this is my thing. It's because of what they did to make the movie. So nutshell version, I'm not gonna ruin the movie. I, I wanna do the historical background for a sec. The nutshell version of historical background is, the Germans have a way of communicating called Enigma that's a code that they believe is uncrackable. Poland is in, they have their top brainiacs, today they would just be doing Sudoku or something, they have their top code breaker brainiacs killing themselves, working overtime trying to break the Enigma code. They get it partially broken. And then Germany attacks it and conquers it in four weeks. As Poland is going down, they send everything they, got, they had to the English. And the English now are putting all their effort into, into figuring this thing out. They, they're, they think they're pretty close with what they've gotten from the Poles. They, they add to it, they've made it a little bit better. The problem is they need an Enigma machine. So the Brits go out submarine hunting because if they can capture a German submarine, not sink it, capture it, they can get the Enigma machine off of it and they can complete the process of breaking the code. So Hollywood made it a US submarine, not a British submarine. Wh what? Why would you change that itty bitty little detail? They even apologize for it at the end of the movie. Why? Is it because the American audience is so thick skulled, so dumb, so incapable of other, putting itself in somebody else's shoes, it can't even relate to Brits? I mean, it's still gonna be a white crew. They're still gonna speak English. They're gonna sound like Romans, of course, because we all know that the Romans had an English accent because of all the Hollywood movies, right? Because the Romans are always portrayed by the English. <laughs> <laughs> Mind blowing. So uh, this is this. I'm telling you this because I want to give another example. So uh, recently there was a Marvel movie. Now you go, okay, 
you've already lost me. It's another comic movie. Who cares? It's Marvel, like comic fatigue. And how can I take that seriously? Well, because that's what everybody else is watching. It still matters. The Marvel movie is largely set in Iraq. I was kind of blown away at the opening scene. I'm like, what is going on here? I didn't know that was even legal, that you could have a movie that takes place in an Arab country that we attempted to genocide and successfully killed 10% of its population. Like, I mean, you know, tax money well spent. Way to bring it home. Not quite, you know, Native American genocide level, but yeah, it's hard to kill people when they're reproducing and fighting back. It's, it's not easy. So, so I'm already blown away and I'm thinking, is this Marvel attempting to unerase Arabs? Can this be happening? The movie's The Eternals and I'm not gonna ruin the movie. Well, I might, but not because I'm gonna tell you the end. I don't, I don't really care, it doesn't matter. Cause for me at this point now, it's a study, right? Like when I watched Black Panther, that was a study. <laughs> Uh, so, <clears throat> there's two Arab adult actors in the movie. One of the superheroes, one of the Eternals, is an Arab, Selma Hayek, who is, of course, Arab Mexican. But it's good. Good. I, she doesn't have a big role, even though she's actually the leader of the Eternals, because her character gets killed early on. So I'm like, oh. Well, that's not good. The other Arab actor has just like five minutes at the very end of the movie. He's the lover of one of the other Eternals. The gay lover of one of the other Eternals. At that moment, I was like, okay, cool. You, you brought in a gay Arab. Like, this is wonderful. You're, you're revealing. But the superheroes start the story in Iraq, there's one Arab, okay, maybe, I guess, she was the leader, except for this. One of the superheroes is named Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh, you know, the story, the epic story about friendship that is born in Iraq, what is it, 5,000, 6,000 years ago, that story, Gilgamesh? He's played by a Korean. Like, where do you go from there? Where do you go from there? Now, it's a step up from what I grew up with. What I grew up with was, whenever Arabs were portrayed in the movies in the 80s, they were always played by Indians, and they were always terrorists. There's 100%. It wasn't like 90%. The Italians are always mafia in the 80s movies. This is 100%. And you know, the nice thing about the Italians being portrayed as mafia is at least there's an Italian actor. They're all Italian actors and they're all Italian directors. So it's like, okay, it's De Niro and Scorsese. You can't be mad if you're Italian. <clears throat> but maybe if you were an Arab, it felt bad. Maybe, got it. It's nice to even be portrayed because the other option is you don't get anything. Like, you're never even seen. Of course, there's a consequence for always having Indian actors play Arabs as terrorists. After 9-11, there were three vengeance killings. One guy was a Coptic Egyptian, so he's a Christian Egyptian. I can imagine what that conversation was as they're killing him. I'm not even Muslim! I'm Christian! It doesn't matter. You're one of them. And they kill him anyway, right? One of the guys was Pakistani. He was Muslim, but he looked South Asian. Why did they think he was an Arab? Because those are the movies they grew up on. There's, he's like screaming, I'm not Arab, I'm Pakistani. They're like, yeah, but you look like an Arab. And he's like, no, no, I don't. <laughs> I don't look anything like an Arab. You all look the same. I'll let God figure it out. And they kill him. The other guy was a sick. He's screaming, I'm not Muslim, I'm not Arab, and they kill him anyway. They're like, you're wearing a turban. Yeah, but it doesn't make me Muslim, and they kill him anyway. And of course, he's from South Asia again, so he's probably because of the portrayal. 
So this isn't me bashing Osprey books. I, I like them. There are these little itty bitty skinny books. They're about this big and they're illustrated and they do a little historical stuff for like uniforms. So you can kind of get a feel for what uh, soldiers might have looked like during that particular event. And some of the artwork is really fantastic. And so if, you know, if you're like me and obsessed with warfare, you might have 40 of these in your library somewhere. And they'll, do, they'll go do, they'll dive. Osprey is great. This is actually a plug for Osprey, not an attack. So in case like there's, there's some Osprey guy who sees my thing, I just need you to know I, I, I love and appreciate what you do, except the book on 7th century Arabs. They, the, whoever the artist was clearly just didn't care. He was just getting a paycheck. He spent little time working on it, so the artwork sucks. But he also apparently hired South Asians because each and every single one of them looks like he's from Pakistan, not from Arabia. And I know in your mind, you're like, dude, I can't tell them apart because, well, that's, that's what happens with erasure and destruction of cultures. Now, Arabs are really diverse. So actually, having somebody look like they're from Pakistan could be, because you can go to Egypt and you can find a person with extremely fair skin, freckles, red hair, and green eyes, and you can find a guy who's very, very, very black with black hair and, and brown eyes and everything in between, but it's mostly a bell curve in the middle. So it's oversimplification to say he doesn't look Arab because I don't know what an Arab looks like necessarily, but because of this constant portrayal thing that Hollywood does with the South Asians, it's kind of gotten to the point where you can't help but point this out. <clears throat> there was a movie, I forgot the name of the movie, but I remember the name of the character. Uh, Angelina Jolie plays her. The character's name is Pearl. And the Pearl character is half, she's a quarter Ashkenazi, a quarter Dutch, a quarter Chinese, and a quarter Cuban, uh, Afro-Cuban, Afro-Cuban. So she's actually a quarter black, quarter Chinese, a quarter Dutch, and a quarter Ashkenazi, Jewish European. Not crazy. I, I want to meet this pearl. Like that, anybody who's that mixed is automatically, instantaneously my dream person. You know what I mean? Angelina Jolie portrays her. Now, to do it, they darkened her skin. Now, maybe they took her to a tanning salon. I don't know. And they curled her hair. But people were mad. African Americans were mad. But when you think about it, she was half white. Pearl is half white. A quarter Chinese and a quarter black. So actually, if they had had a black actress player, it would have been more incorrect, right? But the outrage was that they wanted a person who was a person of color do it. But that's the level of sensitivity that, we, that we've gotten down to. Apu from The Simpsons, his character has been canceled. Why? Because Hank Azaria isn't from South Asia and it's a stereotype, the character's a stereotype and it's an offensive stereotype, but it's a stereotype. But I remember at the time thinking, wow, you guys have gotten to the point, you guys being South Asians, have gotten to the point of acceptance. You can be picky about your portrayals. Arabs are still excited to see terrorists played by South Asians. Look, I'm not completely erased. <laughs> I'm only mostly erased and villainized. <laughs> yeah? Oh, somebody's anticipating me. So, a Cleopatra movie comes out, portrayed, the actress is portrayed as a black woman, so Cleopatra's being portrayed as black. So let me start by acknowledging something. I have zero doubt that some of the outrage is anti-black racism. There's no doubt in my mind. <laughs> we are a profoundly racist planet. And part of that racism 
that's so in our bones and in our cells is, is just a color scheme. And I am there and I want to acknowledge it and I want to be clear that it, I know for a fact some of the outrage is anti-black racism. Having said that, I get why Egyptians are upset. The reason that Egyptians are upset is because here is an Egyptian who could have been portrayed by an Egyptian. And now, instead of an Egyptian portraying them, they're being portrayed by another group, an African American, who has been historically marginalized themselves. And it feels like, wait, you know what it's like to be erased. You know what it's like to have somebody put on blackface. And now all of a sudden you're doing this. It feels like a little bit of betrayal there. Now, I heard the actress say, if you don't like it, don't watch it. And besides, we don't even know who Cleopatra's mother is. I'm sure somebody told her to say that. I have no doubt the actress is a wonderful person and doesn't realize this. She's been lied to. We don't know who Cleopatra's mother is because we don't know if she's Cleopatra the fifth or Cleopatra the sixth. <laughs> In other words, there's no possibility that her mother was Korean or Sub-Saharan African or German. <laughs> we, there is only one outcome. She was either Cleopatra the fifth or Cleopatra the sixth. Here's that controversy. <laughs> so Cleopatra, we're a little confused. Is Cleopatra the fifth her grandmother and Cleopatra the sixth is her mother? That's one option. Option two is Cleopatra the fifth is Cleopatra the sixth and there's actually a miscounting and that's on the table like that could be, we don't know. Option three, is Cleopatra V is her mom, and Cleopatra VI is her sister. And that reminds me of that new heart comedy from the 80s, where the guy would walk in and go, hi, this is my brother Daryl, and this is my other brother Daryl. This is my sister Cleopatra, and this is my other sister Cleopatra. Like, really, did they do this? But they were the Ptolemies. It is the 32nd dynasty of Egypt. At this point, the Egyptian civilization is like 4,500 years old. So if they did that, it wouldn't shock me just from fatigue. How do you have a 4,500 year old civilization and not just be exhausted? You know? <laughs> They're like, I can't. And I want to point out that Cleopatra the seventh, that was amazing because there were only two other women's names in the entire family for 300 years, Arsinoe and Berenica. I'm sorry, Berenica. So, so Cleopatra, Berenica, and Arsinoe, that was it. For the boys, Ptolemy. It's actually easy. There's Ptolemy the first, Ptolemy the second, Ptolemy the third, Ptolemy the fourth, Ptolemy the fifth. It goes all the way to 12. It's a really easy dynasty to memorize everybody's names because it, it's in order, so you just need to remember the number and you're good to go. Cleopatra the seventh is the last, right? She's the one who is defeated at the Battle of Actium with Marcus Antony by Augustus Caesar. So not only is there no real controversy over her mother, but it's way worse than that. So if, if I'm me, I have two parents, so that's one generation back. I have four grandparents. I have eight great-grandparents. I have 16 great-great-grandparents. I have 32 great-great-great-grandparents. Well, I should have 32 great-great-great-grandparents. She had five. She had four Greeks and one Persian. She didn't even have an Egyptian, not a one. Her, she was so inbred. She made the Romanovs look like they were not. She was, I mean, she was West Virginia. I know I'm gonna get some hate comments now. She was like Arkansas. It was so bad. At one point, one of her ancestral uncles and I don't know if it was his great, her great uncle or her great great uncle married his niece. Like they kept it in the family. One of the reasons why 
the 32nd dynasty did this was they got a little confused. So the, when, when, a queen, when a queen married a pharao, the family would adopt her and then refer to her as a sister. But they did, and, and sometimes that was true, but usually it wasn't, it was a symbolic thing. And the Macedonians thought it was a literal thing, so they did it. And they just took it too far. <laughs> so actually, what they needed to do was find a Greek actress and have her portray Cleopatra. So at some level, the Egyptians were just going to lose because she wasn't even ethnically Egyptian. But she was there 300 years. And for the record, if you did a DNA test on an Egyptian, you're going to find Persian and Greek blood in them. So it's not completely wrong to have hired an Egyptian. But also, if your goal is to unerase a population of people by telling their story, why not go? And, and, and for the record, if you lined up a Greek, an Iranian, next to each other, I, you can't really tell them apart. Like, what's ironic is Turkey is in between. And if you put a Turk in there, you'd be like, oh yeah, I can tell the Turk. But the, the Greeks and the Iranians, I have a hard time sometimes with them. And then if you grabbed an Egyptian and put them in that mix, you might still have a little bit of trouble. Like it's that, that eastern part of the Mediterranean going into Iran. Iranians have a very distinct look. Don't get me wrong. It's just for some reason, I feel like Greeks defy it a little bit and jump. I think it's when you've done that much warfare with a population, you share a lot of genetic material. That's, I think that's how that works out. Um, that's, that's one of the purposes I think of warfare is to keep Arkansas or West Virginia from happening. It's to keep things kind of moving and fluid. I know that's, and that's, that's the minefield I wanted to walk into. Uh, so, so I guess my point is I have to ask, here's a population of people who aren't portrayed. Lawrence of Arabia. It's a Mexican and an English guy. It's Anthony Quinn and Alec Guinness. Now, don't get me wrong, Omar Sharif is there, but Omar Sharif is, the, is like a, a god. He, he, he's so perfect and angelic and amazing and charismatic. Not including him in the movie would have been a sin. You know what I mean? Like it was, there's no way you didn't include Omar Sharif in that movie. I think it was mandatory. But, you know, if he had, had like one level lower in looks and charisma and charm, he would have never been there. It had just been all Greeks and Mexicans. So we, we have a culture of erasing Arabs. And here's a chance to throw an Arab on the screen. And they don't do it. And they must have known this was going to create that stink. And I swear they did it just to drive up ratings. It's a really nasty, cynical thing to do. Shame on you. That's my point. And by the way, if you're part of the anti-black racism, shame on you too, screw you. <laughs> just so we're clear, I don't want that to be confusing. By the way, if you wanted to, you could just go back a couple of dynasties. The Kush dynasty of Egypt were all black. And they were pharaohs who ruled Egypt. It's, and if you go to Egypt, you'll find black Egyptians. I mean, like, this is not a... Egypt is the first uh, majority not black country in the middle, in the modern period to have a black president. And it had two. The first one almost doesn't count, Mohammed Najib, because he was, he was in power for all of a couple of years. He was half Sudanese, but Anwar Sadat was also half Sudanese. And they were, so they were both black, half black. They were as, they were blacker than Barack Obama because, right? I mean, if you're not black Egyptian, you're still part black. You know what I mean? Genetically, Egyptians are about 60% white, about 20% black, and about 20% Asian. So, in case you wanted to have the numbers. <clears throat> you know how, I know how racist you are and you want to categorize everything. I'm the same way, I'm just fighting it, because it's gross. But you get it, right? You, you see the person, you have the assumption, and then you go along with it. No, 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 you block the assumption, and then you try to be open-minded and not go along. That's what, I always get that mixed up. I always get that mixed up. All right, so, uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop having that controversial conversation and dive into the regularly scheduled program.